This is Mecca. The hub around which these thousands of people revolve is the axis of Islam, the Kaaba. It is the focal point to which five times a day, every day of their lives, 700 million people turn to pray. It is a rough-built, empty cube of stone. Yet at the beginning of the 7th century, in pre-Islamic times, when Europe was deep in its own dark ages, this cube was stuffed with pagan idols and exploited by the privileged few to maintain a social order of hideous brutality. It is the duty of every Muslim to make a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in a lifetime. In doing so, they follow the example of the man who threw out the idols and cleansed the Kaaba. The man through whom God revealed his great gift, the Quran, which is the foundation of the Muslim faith. The name of this man, this man who changed the face of the world, is Muhammad, messenger of God. Messenger of God is now also the title of an epic film. It has not been made by Hollywood, though it draws heavily on Hollywood's technology, techniques and traditions. Indeed, it is a film that Hollywood said could never be made. Because of the Muslim taboo against idols, Islam would never permit a physical representation of the Prophet himself. But the story of Muhammad, of the triumph of his passionate idealism over violent persecution, has now been told by a Muslim filmmaker, Mustafa Akkad. Well, I did the film because uh, it is a personal thing for me. Besides its production values as a film, it has its story, its intrigue, its drama. Besides all this, I think uh, there was something personal. Being a Muslim myself, who lived in the West, I felt that it's my obligation, my duty, to tell the truth about Islam. There is a religion that has a 700 million following, yet it's so little known about it, which surprised me. I thought I should tell the story that will bring this bridge, this gap, to the West. Even though there were several attempts by the major studios to do a film about Muhammad, and they failed because they approached it from an angle that they were going to show the Prophet. And this is something very sacrilegious as far as Islam is concerned. They are very strict as far as showing the prophets, not just Muhammad, Jesus, Jesus, Moses. They feel prophets should not be seen. But I felt I can do it because I understand the subject better and I can do it without showing the prophet. And I contacted a well-known scriptwriter, Harry Craig, who thought, like me, that it could be done. My, my, my pleasure, my privilege in writing this film was, in fact, that I was writing into and against the ignorance of the world about this religion, about this man, about the Koran, about what Islam is and what it was. Well, this was, this was easy because it's in, the, it's in the nature of the religion of, of, the, of Islam. Because Islam was not a new religion. Muhammad, the whole principle is that, that what God said to Muhammad had been said to prophets before Muhammad, but people had turned away from it. We have a script after two years, and we have the approval of the religious authorities, Al-Azhar University in Cairo, who stamped the script page by page. The next thing is to find a place to shoot the old Mecca, which all the story, where the story happens. The new Mecca, of course, in Saudi Arabia now has skyscrapers and the modern changes that we could not shoot there. So we, f we search for a place that resembles that Mecca. Eight Bouchon is a small village in the foothills of the Atlas Mountains, about 15 kilometers from Marrakesh. The setting and the scale of the village were perfectly in keeping with 7th century Mecca. But Mecca itself was a very wealthy town set at the crossroads of the major caravan routes of Arabia. So for the film, 
A splendid superstructure, indicative of an entirely different economic status, was literally grafted onto the foundations of the existing buildings. The bewildered inhabitants suddenly found themselves living on the ground floor of houses suitable for the wealthiest merchants of Mecca. They were encouraged to remain in residence, to give natural life to this artificial city. As extras, they people the picture. And as laborers, they were recruited to help with the construction of this dream that was resolving into a kind of reality around them. We had 300 men, very unskilled, when we started the set. And uh, after four and a half months building, um, I must say they were very skilled. In many countries I've worked in, I must say that the fellows from Egypt are the best and uh, anywhere in the world I'd always like to have them again. When Mohammed was persecuted out of Mecca, the city of Medina became his base and the site of the first mosque. This too had to be recreated. In both cities, 200 houses, four palaces and 29 miles of wall. Demand for materials quickly outstripped supply. Uh, materials were quite a problem. The scaffolding tube was exhausted in Morocco. Uh, we had to go to a company uh, which imported from France and Italy. In all, we had over a half a million meters of uh, tube and or hundreds of thousands of fittings. The plaster, we had a hell of a problem waiting for factories to work through weather conditions. After three months of building, the tail end of a hurricane blew itself out on this plaster mecca and reduced it to rubble. It was a foretaste of the film's difficulties, but also of the determination that was to surmount them, as these two cities of ancient Arabia began again to take shape to the designs of Tambi Larson and Morris Fowler. In doing a picture set in this period, which is about the year 600, we've been very lucky in one way that not a great deal is known about it, so what research we have done has been fairly easy, but for the rest of the designing I've had to use my own imagination, which has been much more interesting than having to follow things written in books. With the buildings complete, they had to be furnished and dressed with objets d'art, bric-a-brac, and all the paraphernalia of life in a prosperous trading city of the seventh century. In finding all the props that we needed, in this country, we had to search quite a long way. And some of the things we wanted, of course, weren't available here, so quite a lot of the props we've had to manufacture ourselves. We brought some very fine pot makers with us, or we've had to have things made locally to the designs uh, that we needed for our period. The pagan idols, which were the objects of Mohammed's especial contempt, were prevalent everywhere in Mecca until the Prophet's triumphant re-entry into the city to destroy them. 11,000 arrows, 1,000 bows, shields, swords and spears for the two armies that fought bitterly for or against Mohammed, all of these had to be made in workshops set up for the purpose. This ancient world was recreated in the course of four and a half months around the inhabitants of Eight Bouchon. But Islam is their living faith and distant Mecca is the focus for their daily prayer. And when they realized that this symbol, the Kaaba, was now standing in their own village and that the village itself had been transformed into ancient Mecca, their astonishment turned to awe. The arrival of camera, crane and lights restored the balance between illusion and reality in favor of illusion. The team of Oscar-winning technicians had arrived to look at and to feel their own peculiar way round this world that Tambi Larson and Morris Fowler had created. They would be working in it for the next 13 months to make the illusion on film as complete as possible that this is Mecca, that the date is 610, and that this was where Mohammed was born and lived in the making of one of the major religions of the world. Make a mark there if that's at all possible. We'd like to have something down there for you to smash The sets were now ready for the actors who would give the illusion of living in them. But before they appear, they have to be dressed appropriately. That was the task of costume designer Phyllis Dalton, who 
clothed the populations not only of Mecca and Medina, but also of the courts of Abyssinia, Byzantium, Persia and Egypt, and the armies that fought for and against Mohammed. A small number of uh, principal's costumes were, were made in London, and uh, a certain number of others were made in Madrid. And the rest of them, we've uh, purchased the material in Morocco and have made them ourselves. I think one does have to have a, a sympathy and a rapport with actors because I think it's terribly important that um, you give them clothes to wear that they can f then forget about. And if they're happy and comfortable in their clothes and forget them, um, then their performance will be more convincing and then you help them and your director. And as my lady can see, ravished to the eye. Yes, seven lengths. Twenty dinar. Abu Sofyan's wife. Fifteen. I wanted to do two versions, one in Arabic and one in English, with complete separate cast. Because Arabic and English are two separate and different languages. You cannot dub Arabic into English, nor English into Arabic. It's very difficult for the lips movement. And when I budgeted the film, I budgeted on the basis that the Arabic version will be extra few takes. But I was wrong. Uh, it took us much longer. And there is no way you can learn this from anybody else, because this is the first time done. Because the style of acting and the Arabic is a bit different. It's more dramatic, more poetic, more lengthy. And so we had to change all our style as far as camera setups and lighting setups. And so it wasn't as easy as we thought it would be. <laughs> The presence of Mohammed himself pervades the whole film, but his is a presence the audience is cleverly made to sense without seeing. The leading human character we do see is Hamza, Mohammed's uncle. When he meets unarmed men, Mohammed is, is a liar. Liar? You don't let him speak. Where's the line? Where's the truth? He's played in English by Anthony Quinn and in Arabic by Abdallah Ray. The central personality clash of the story is between Hamza and the leader of the respectable merchants of Mecca, Busofyan, played by Michael Ansara. And Hamdi Ray. The conflict is fomented by the passionate hatred of Hamza by Busofyan's wife, Hind, played by Irene Papas and Mona Wasif. The African slave Bilal, one of the heroes of Islam, was the first Muazin. He was one of the first disciples of Muhammad and is played by Johnny Secker and Ali Salam. But here we find ourselves in a situation where two actors have to do the same scene, exactly the same scene, but with two different languages. They both are afraid of each other. At the beginning, the spirit of competition was there. And I didn't want them at the beginning to watch each other because I didn't want anybody to be influenced by another. I want every actor to give his own interpretation to the part. But then I found out that it was very healthy to really watch each other. And by doing so, I realized that it created such, a, such an atmosphere of cooperation. The actors were getting along together fine. They were getting together before the set and they were in, uh, viewing the part. And I thought this is exactly what I wanted to do. This people, the contact of people, understand each other and getting along fine. This is exactly the purpose of the whole film. I think film acting is very difficult. I think all acting is very difficult. But I think film acting on a film of this size is particularly difficult because uh, 
very easily the actor can feel remote from what is going on. Sometimes he isn't called for weeks, sometimes he does his scenes out of order, and the very size of the unit itself is an enormous strain on the actor. I think always playing historical characters is very difficult because you, as it were, have a responsibility towards the people who you play, um, even in the remote past. And in this case, uh, for the English cast, it is doubly difficult because the Arab cast is so uh, aware of uh, each character, aware of their idiosyncrasies. And it's very interesting how different people have reacted to their doppelganger, as we call them, in a way that... The Prophet has seen you. You're not the rope or drag the prisoners. They have roped us. Cut them loose. I said cut them loose and give them water and share your food. The only part that wasn't played by two actors was the part that wasn't played by an actor at all. Director of photography, Jack Hildyard, explained. We devised a technique uh, in which we used the camera as the prophet and all actors who are playing to the prophet look directly at the lens of the camera. We have found that sometimes the prophet had to move, stand up or sit down, and we use our camera just like another actor in the picture. What is the prophet of God doing? Carrying bricks, eh? Give me that. Look, you are doing too much. Please, go and sit down. We'll do it. So it is through the camera that the audience experiences something of what Mohammed experienced in relation to his fellow men. From the low point of his being stoned and persecuted out of his own city, to the high point of his triumphal re-entry at the head of a peaceful march by the thousands of followers who had joined him in exile. <laughs> Now came the big move, to move to the port of Tripoli. We had tons of clothes and armaments and equipments and vehicles and even horses that we have trained. Of course, Tripoli is not a city that is used to film filmmaking. It doesn't have the film facilities, the sound stages, the equipment. So we have to start all over again to rebuild sets and above all to find a base for our equipment. We looked and we found an old warehouse for storage of tobacco and we turned it into an interior sound stage. We had to soundproof the sound stage, put scaffolding for lights. But then in the end it, we, we had in our hands a good sound stage, as good as any place you find any place. The palace of the king of Abyssinia, the lion of Judah a Christian who gave asylum to some of the earliest persecuted Muslims. Good. Their stiff necks will hang them. God has spoken to us before. Through Abraham, Noah, Moses, and through Jesus Christ. Why should we be so surprised that God speaks to us now through Muhammad? Who taught you those names? They are named in the Quran. I knew Muhammad when he was an orphan minding sheep. And we knew Christ as a carpenter. And from the persecuted to the persecutor. This is the house of Busufyan, the wealthiest and most powerful merchant of Mecca, who saw the Muslims as a threat to the fabric of the social pyramid which sustained him at its peak. Doesn't Muhammad realize we live by giving housing to the gods? We own the Kaaba. Every year the tribes of Arabia come here to Mecca to pray and to buy from us. Now were we to replace 300 gods with just one, whom we cannot even see, who is supposed to be in Taif and Medina, here in my house, in Jerusalem, on the moon? <laughs> After finishing the interior scenes in Tripoli, now we have to do the big battle scenes, which we have kept to the end. And for, the, for that, we need the good weather, good guaranteed sun all the time. We found a place near Seba, 
that's a thousand miles deep inside the Sahara Desert. The government officials were very, very helpful in that area. They have just finished the housing project of flats for the people. And before they give them to the people, they gave us 300 flats. And also they gave us a technical school, newly built. It fit perfect for our base of operation. It has beautiful storage space for our wardrobe, for our sets. We have turned one big hall into a first-class restaurant to when we had brought the cooks, the chefs, all the way from England. While preparations were being made for mounting the major battles, a much smaller unit penetrated deep into the unchartable and daily shifting dunes. They went to record some of the hazards faced by the first persecuted Muslims. And despite 20th century technology, they faced some of the hazards themselves. When they were driven out of Mecca, a small group of Muslims set out across the desert on foot, heading for Abyssinia. To record the farewell scene between Hamza and the refugees, soundman David Hildyard faced one of the paradoxical problems of the desert, an excess of silence in which the smallest sound travels for miles. So to record the scene at close range, he disguised an assistant as one of the refugees and sent him out into the desert with them. At the height of the day, the sun whites out the desert to a featureless sea of sand. But as the sun sinks, the colors deepen and dimples of shadow darken escarpments of dune. In one of these, Miraculously, the refugee Muslims find cover when horsemen from Mecca ride out to destroy them. quality about the vast emptiness of the desert beating with intense heat under a daily canopy of blue. Here man, alone and at the mercy of elements that might at any moment extinguish him, has always been susceptible to communication with God. And it is in country like this that the seeds of Islam grew into the vital religion which within a hundred years of the Prophet's death had spread throughout the Middle East. It is the beginning of this evangelical purpose that the film unit is capturing here. The moment when Mohammed sent messengers to Byzantium, to Persia and to Egypt. Man's dependence on animals in the desert is a commonplace. And that they should exploit such invaluable beasts in conflict amongst themselves was inevitable. I think over a period of about six weeks, I completed the job of finding 100 horses. Getting them to sever, of course, meant stabling for 100 stallions, where they've got to be kept separate, as we can't tie them up close to each other. So we built 100 stables and put each stallion in his stable. All food, of course, had to be bought in Tripoli, which was a long way away, put on trucks and taken down to sever. Of course, water being the main problem there. There we had some water bowsers which were brought onto location and were filled each day. Of course, naturally, we used thousands of gallons of water. Where horses have got to be watered three times a day, especially when filming. Then, of course, grooms, they've got to be trained. The boys look after the horses because a lot of them hadn't seen horses before. And eventually they caught on and uh, turned out to be very good. We had to train the horses to fall and uh, Horses to be ridden by actors. Very important, especially with actors' horses. They've got to be right, they've got to be quiet, got to do the right thing on the day. 
the stunt horses, not such a big problem because the stunt boys know what they're doing and they more or less handle that side of it. Jeff, get to your left, Jeff. None of these horses was a stranger to the idea of a hard day's work. But the kind of general haulage they were used to did not equip them for the roles they now had to play. But they were in the hands of trainers and stuntmen who knew precisely what they wanted from the horses and how to get it. It takes about two months to teach a horse to fall, and it pays the stuntmen to train them well, because if a horse falls badly, the broken bones are much more likely to be human than a horse. It also pays them to soften up the sand a bit, both in training and before the battle itself. It's a different way of life for the horses, more exciting, certainly. And just possibly more enjoyable. Camels, uh, providing you've got the time with camels, you need a lot more patient, patience with the actual camel than you do with the horse. The camel can be a very contrary animal. And then again, I had the experience from pre previous pictures with camels. And... The advantage of a camel is you don't need stabling, you can hobble him and you can tie him out or just, he's a desert animal anyway. Naturally, over the period we've had all these horses, it's only quite natural that you will get attached to them. Not to one, but to most of them. This is the heartbreaking thing, I think, when the day you've got to load them up, take them back and sell them off or at least find good homes for them and hope that the people who get them will appreciate them. It's certainly heartbreak day, the day we say, wrap it up and take the horses away. But that day is two battles away yet, and with the horses trained, they await the arrival of 270 actors and film technicians, tons of weaponry and other equipment, plus the opposing armies.
Aquí en la pantolera. The battles which we have in the film, they are period battles, historic battles, which involve spears, arrows. That means we have to have fight hand-to-hand -hand clashes, therefore everybody is in the scene. And that means you cannot shoot like modern warfare, shoot one side, shooting with guns, and then shoot the other side. Therefore we had to plan everything ahead of time complete battle be choreographed from A to Z. We have to draw every scene before we decide on it. We had to meet with the art director, the cameraman, and assistant directors, and plan the whole battle like a military operation. The difference is that also here you have to plan both sides of the battle. We were excited that we got the assistance of the Libyan army. But the army is trained on modern warfare. So now here we come to teach them on the old sword and arrow fights. It hasn't oh. been easy, and, but uh, it helped us, of course, tremendously with disciplined soldiers rather than using just normal extras. The tension of the battle on the screen the ebb and flow of fortune either side, the death or glory of individual combatants is totally convincing. It seems to be all spears and arrows and hubbub and turmoil, the hideous cacophony of actual conflict. But behind the camera, the story is a little different. The fighter rangers skillfully ensure that no one actually gets hurt, least of all themselves. <laughs> And here's a troop of exceptionally well-trained and disciplined men mounting a tactical assault on a tea trolley. <laughs> Nor are the effects of deadly arrows quite what they see. They're sometimes even reluctant to find their mark. But leaving the battle till last, gives the director the opportunity to work off all the aggression and frustration that has built up over the past 18 months. And that time-honored custom of the battlefield, the right to turn your back and run like hell, has to be observed, apparently, whether the battle is true or false. But for most of the protagonists, 
most of the time is nothing like as hectic as those few minutes on the screen imply. There's plenty of lying around on the endless beach, waiting in vain for the tide to come in. There is even time for the star to talk to Mohammed Sanusi, the associate producer, about the art of filmmaking. People working to Mohammed. Well, I think that uh, I think we all I think that there are about 250 actors here, and I think that generally the way pictures go are going nowadays, and the content of the pictures and the violence of pictures. I think that we were all kind of so happy to be in a picture that spoke about the spiritual quality in man rather than the violence in man. And you just can't help taking your hat off to some of the heroes. And even at the height of the most complex military embroilment, civil routines have to be ruthlessly observed. Wait for us. But whatever activity was going on, either in front or behind the camera, there was one element that put a temporary stop to everything. In the first battle of Bedra, the Muslims were assisted by the timely intervention of a sandstorm. This second battle of Bedra was frequently and frustratingly interrupted by the same phenomenon. It seemed the wind's purpose was to sandblast this human blemish, this vast film unit, off the smooth face of the Sahara. If that was its intention, it failed. But it certainly held up shooting with its blinding, cutting fog of sand. And yet, when the real thing was required for the story, it had to be provided under controlled conditions by an old Second World War Spitfire engine. Before each day's battle, the hundreds of protagonists had to be relieved of their 20th century paraphernalia. The tire tracks of vehicles were constantly having to be swept out. Hundreds of turbans had to be tied and retied in precisely the same shape as they were the day before. The eyes for all this continuity detail were Phyllis Crocker's and her Arab counterpart, Maher Shafiq Ibrahim's. And it was their responsibility to convey a coherent account of all this apparent chaos of the battlefield in Libya to the two sets of cutting rooms back in London. Stop her. Um, I tried that. Just lengthen the incoming shot a little bit. Mm -hmm. Have a look. I think it's much better. It's a big army. Better, isn't it? I had a uh, Hussein and I talked about it on the Arabic version as well. Mm -hmm. He's going to try it. I think he's just set it up next door. Here, the two films, made by separate casts but filmed by the same unit, were finally separated into two versions by English editor John Bloom and his Arab counterpart Hussein Afifi. Muhammad. عرضت عليك شروط من قبل للاتفاق بينك وبين قريش. كده أحسن من الأول مثل ما شوف أنت مرة. Sound editor Chris Greenham had the complex task of preparing effects and dialogue for four-track stereophonic sound. And Maurice Jarre was the composer of the international language of both films, the music.
right back, George. <laughs> Maurice Char spent nearly a year researching Middle Eastern music, and the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra has been augmented with instruments like the Canoon, the Martino, to give the orchestration an appropriate Arabian quality. Exactly the same uh, intensity you have Maurice Jarre's music is the finishing touch of Oscar-winning quality to an epic film that has engaged the top cinematographic talents of the West in telling this great story of the East, and telling it from the Eastern point of view. Yes, I would do it all over again. I am very happy, satisfied for the accomplishment. The film is a reality. But sad for, for us all who worked on the film to disband. We were 28 different nationalities and cultures. We were able to bridge this, these different cultures. And we worked under a, under a spirit of cooperation and understanding and I think if this film would carry the same message I'd be even happier. It is the consummate achievement of Mustafa Akkad that he has made a film that not only bridges the cultures but that it does so in a way that will have enormous public appeal in both East and West. Muslims re-enter Mecca on the first pilgrimage, it is Bilal, the first muezzin, who climbs the Kaaba and makes the first call to the faithful from Mecca itself. God is most great. God is most great. I witness that there is no other God but God. I witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God. Come to prayer. Come to good works. Come to prayer. God is most great.